And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother into the temple, previously known for Rapture, both both its original and later on its big red ugly edition, as well, <laughs> as well as one of its offshoots in the form of Dragon Town. Now coming to us with the with a portal fantasy multiverse in the form of Wanderer, the one and only one and only Gregory Rap. Don't ask for his rap sheet. <laughs> today? Oh, pretty good. So. Yeah, no, it's it's hilarious. Every time everyone hears rap, I know when we released rap, they're like, oh, you should have put an extra P in there. So it's like, you know, referencing your name, and I'm like, I don't know if I can handle that. You know, my ego might explode or something from all that referencing. <laughs> uh, you reference too much, and you start turning into a Seltzerberg project. Yeah, or you remember that? I, he used to re write these really awful yet sometimes they were kind of fun uh, uh, novels. Clive Custler, and he'd have he'd be like a character in his own novels, and like Dirk Pitt would run into Clive Custler at random times, and it's just like it's a little weird for me. But you know, some people I guess are cool with it. <laughs> well, Kevin Smith seemed seemed to like putting himself in his own movies back back when he actually did that instead instead of just cry and and um, beg for Disney's attention. <laughs> That's a good point. So, so I think the the first thing I think to be addressed is what is um how how did the idea for Wanderer come about? Was this something that ha that um had its first stages when you were still working on Rapture? Was it something that the idea came about after Rapture? What's the origin story? <laughs> So it's odd. So it was a, a culmination of things. So I was, about a year ago, I was reading some articles about um, the War on Terror. And, you know, just kind of like uh, the language used during the War on Terror, all these really weird euphemisms and double speak and everything else. And that just kind of like ruminated in the back of my mind. And then I started working on Rapture. And then after Rapture, I was kind of needing some other project to work on. And um, I started working on this story. Um, which will later become part of Wanderer's universe is um, the story of an, a military intervention in this city-state, and in the multiverse. And um, you know, the man in teal comes out. He was actually originally introduced in Dragon Town, and so these things just kind of came together. And then one final thing, I think it was like the L.A. Times was talking about this American soldier who had this brain injury that caused him to hallucinate dead people he had seen over in Syria and he thought he had actually been cursed, hexed. And I was like, you know what? Fuck it. You know what? Let's bring all this together, right? And then of course, I grew up watching, you know, the the cheesy classics of Stargate, SG-1, Stargate, oh, let's see, Atlantis, and then Universe, which was kind of kind of fun but kind of disappointing. It was kind of like Hey, you know, um, Battlestar Galactica is done, and we want to steal kind of some of their aesthetic and put it in the Stargate universe, which is really weird. And so, yeah, all these things just kind of came together, and that's where Wander goes up. So, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and for whatever reason, when I when I saw the description of a man in teal, the first thing that came to my mind was the cigarette smoking man in X Files. Uh, him or um, you remember the guy from uh, uh, was it Half Life, the Half Life series? Yeah, G Man. He's kind of like, yeah, exactly. It's just that mysterious kind of bureaucrat who knows a lot about you and is kind of creepy and like comes at weird times, and that's kind of the man in teal. Like you know, he has knowledge that other people you know seek, and yet. Um, he, no one can seem to catch him, and he always seems to catch you off guard, sort of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now that be that being said, I think one of the other things that stood that stood out to me is that you guys are using, as I under, as I understand it, a 
mo a modified version of the of the um, DPS of Awesome DPS by R. E. Davis. Yes. Um, what pro what prompted using that system of all the ones you could use for this particular kind of game? I, again, it was kind of a random moment. You know, I I remember playing dice pool systems back in the day and thinking, you know, these things are atrocious. I hate them. But now, as I've gotten older, I, I kind of appreciate them a little bit more. Um, I feel like they have, they're a little bit easier to, one, play in some ways, some ways. And then the other thing is, is getting a, a beginner to play, right? So that was one of the things I wanted to do is like, all right, I have a lot of six-sided dice and, and, and I can use those to convert them into fudge or fate dice, which is what the core dice are. And I can get a beginner playing in minutes. Right. Um, I live in a rural area of the United States where sometimes finding a 20 sided die is a pain in the ass. And so I'm just like, you know what? I get six sided dice all day long. And so that's what kind of got me into this is like, hey, I'm going to try a dice pool system. And I I always turn away from them. You know, when I was building Rapture originally, it was going to be a 10 sided die um, dice pool system. And then I was like, man, I don't like this. And then Breathless kind of came to me and I was like, you know what? I'm going to fork that but uh yeah i found awesome dps on itch i started reading i'm like you know what i want to hack this you know and so that's kind of my my journey is hacking that i'm still working on it, trying to smooth out a few things so using fudge or fate dice i say fudge first because fudge technically came first you know yes um, that's how it is anyone who anyone who argues because they call them fate dice yeah, I know. I love it because I see it online all the time. They're like, "Oh, what? What? Why did Fudge take Fate Dice?" And it's like, "No, no, no. It's the other way around. Fudge, you know, gave us the world of uh, Fudge Dice, and Fate just, you know, was more popular." Um, although I've noticed there's been a rising popularity in Fudge too, which is kind of weird. I'd, ima um, I'd but imagine. Anyways. I'd imagine part of that is due to the fact that. Evil Hat's kind of been dragging their damn feet regarding support for Fate. They've been yeah. more, more interested in doing their own in the their own little random ass pet projects. Or pro I on I honestly think that the fiasco with Fate of Cthulhu ended up screwing them over in the long run because that yeah. what because that wasn't what was going to be expected. You hear you hear the words Fate of Cthulhu, and I think your mind would probably would probably go. Oh, it's Call of Cthulhu, but using fate rules, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. That's and then not that's what they did. Not the case. Yeah, exactly. And then they decided to be smug about it, and I think, th or claim, or the whole speech about them reclaiming the reclaiming the the um, stories of Lovecraft from from Lovecraft him himself. Which, if you know anything about Lovecraft's actual story, that you'll like, I do, you'll find that kind of thing very distasteful. Um, yeah. I'm not going to go too much into it, but he had a really bad he had a really bad hand in his life. But Oh yeah. Yeah. He but the thing but the thing is pe that's what people wanted. They wanted the Lovecraftian horror exploration taking place in the 1920s or the 1890s. They did not yeah. want some weird ass terminator fanfic. Yeah, and and to me, I I feel like Evil Hat's really gone away from what made them kind of a, a name for a lot of gamers. Like I remember, was it Spirit of the Century? That's when they really had fate really jump off into the you know the the world that we see it today. Um, Spirit of the Century was a lot of fun. It was quirky as hell, but it was a cheap what paperback that you could buy at almost any game shop or on Amazon. And, you know, you had those quirky dice and it was, it was really cool. And then, I don't know, when I got my fake core rule book, I was kind of like, meh, this is, this isn't, this isn't spirit of the century. And I know it's not supposed to be, but I miss that quirkiness. And I feel like they're, they're playing. Um, I don't know. They're, they're, they're changing their direction. And in, in some ways I'm, I'm kind of disappointed. I wish they were, Still going with the the some of their legacy stuff, but and then supporting fate. Why the hell are you dropping fate off? Like it's a it's a pretty cool system if you 
if you if you look at I'd say more of the the lighter rules than the heavier rules, but you know that's just my my take on it. There was so. also the fact that the last major support was Fate Condensed, which when that yeah. came out, I was like, what What's the point of this when you you've already made you've already made a streamlined version of Fate in Accelerated? Yeah, so there's so there's the core Accelerated condensed and then was it the space toolkit that was kind of fun i think that one came after condensed didn't it i want to say i don't remember but i i remember um talking to one of the people over there and asking like hey you guys have an srd for space toolkit because it's really sweet and i remember getting this really sour email about it like no not anytime soon and it was like oh okay you ever heard the Thanks. expression "you catch more flies with honey than vinegar"? Yeah, yeah, that's that's <laughs> kind of that. Fit. That's the first thing I was thinking too. It's like you want long term and and you want community support for this thing, and you and you're just kind of sour grapes when you're dealing with community members. It's like eh, okay, so. But uh, to get back to um, the DPS, the reason I chose the the fake dice, the fudge dice, whatever you want to call them now, I'm calling is, them the fudge dice. And any and if anyone has a problem, then it's a free country, and they are free to be wrong. Exactly. So, um, and it, really, they remind me of a D three. That's basically what they are, essentially. Is a is a quirky D three. I don't know if you've seen that with uh, it was a Dungeon Crawl Classics has one. Yeah, I've that seen. They get in I've their seen unusual it. set. Yeah. And, so, uh, I'm just not allowed to. It's... I'm just not allowed to use them because, ever, because um, I ha because of that little because of a little stunt I pulled a long time ago where I rigged the kitchen floor with a bunch of four-sided dice <laughs> uh, that's hilarious but yep. yeah so um the fudge dice statistically are a very bell curvy die like i mean you grab four of them and your most likely result is zero and so one of the things about wanderer is is that if you're going to get into a gunfight you need to stack the deck so to speak because you and your your opponent are more likely to get a zero meaning you're going to get a draw and so i think that's kind of cool because you could be blasting away at each other and nothing happens and then maybe change the tactic a little bit find something that gives you more of an advantage and then overcome your your enemy or your challenge as i call it in the in the rule set that's out right now and um i thought that was really cool like how playing it it's super weird um, going from Breathless uh, Rapture, which is, you know, you have all these polyhedrals and, you know, you have various steps with those to go into, you know, basically D6s again, you know, and I, I, I like that, you know, I want to make the hobby as accessible to new players as possible, but also make veterans maybe get kind of this rekindled interest in role playing games too, um, because I've noticed that. With the addition wars and and curmudgery all over the internet and stuff like that like even veterans um even like myself like i've, I've played role-playing games 15 20 years now and, and you know it's sometimes it's kind of hard to rekindle that interest you know uh, as you get older and you don't have as much time and so i want to try to do that for a lot of folks who you know like ah i haven't played in 10 years i'd like to play again well here's a game for you you can print it out you get some funky dice where you can get the regular old D6s and play it, you know? Hmm. And so that's why DPS, uh, for me, was uh, a, a nice choice because it was, what, uh, a pamphlet in, in length, you know, rules-wise. I, I expanded a little bit and made my own tweaks and added skills and various other things. And I think um, when we go forward with the core rule set and which will be a much more expanded set um we'll have a good baseline for that i think uh, and people have been pretty positive about it so mm -hmm. um now that that being said you describe it as portal fantasy i think <laughs> that's some that's something to get to get into as far as what that ex what exactly that's going to mean what that's going to pertain is it just lit just literally what it sounds like on the tin or is there something more to it yeah so this idea that it you know they're not stargates they're shimmers 
And so basically there's these portals that show up randomly thousands of years ago and people can walk through them. You may live going to the other side. You may die. You may disappear completely. Nobody knows, right? And then there are some that are more stable. And so the idea was is I wanted to have a, a game that's exploratory, right? So you go into the shimmer. You know, if it's one that's used quite often and it's pretty stable, you're fine. But maybe you get dumped off on a, you know, a remote planet taking this random shimmer. And, you know, now it becomes kind of survival oriented and trying to figure out why is a shimmer bringing me here? And and so I didn't like the idea of a Stargate because Stargate, to me, um, I don't know. Like having to do an address and everything else, and having a chapa eye, to, or not the chapa eye. What is it called? The 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 portal shield. I think that's just to me. I don't like that. I want something that you can't really block. It's always there. You know, you can. And the cool thing is, like you're walking down a path, and you you enter the shimmer, and on the other side, you're somewhere else, like the cover has. And I really like that idea. And it's it hints at a magic or a technology that that's created them. Um, in fact, the two major factions, the commonality and the faceless, um, are diametrically opposed for various reasons, but the, the faceless uses magic um, to help explain the, the shimmers. And then, of course, the commonality uses mo modernity, uh, you know, sciences and technologies to try to explain where these things come from. And um, yeah, so what I want to do with the game when it gets to a fuller a core set is I want it to be a very integral part of exploration, moving around. And one of the things I'm, I'm building right now is a system where when, say, you go into a shimmer and you know this is a shimmer that's bringing you to some unknown place, you and the, the referee will take a, a stack of cards and some dice and roll out a new locale or world, right, that you can explore. And so each time you go through these little less known shimmers, um, you're going to new worlds, new locales. And so it's kind of a, uh, exploration crawl, I guess you could call it, um, without, you know, some of the annoying map, uh, references and stuff like that. And then the other thing too is, is that I wanted to make it a multiverse because there's a lot of cool stuff that can happen in the multiverse. You can have doppelgangers. You can have, you know, like these mirror worlds with the slight differences from one another. And and so it's really neat for causing conflict and offering challenges to players, if that makes sense. And it it's funny you mention that since there there is a um there is there is a bit of concept there's a bit of concept art that I've kept I've kept in my back folder. It's not concept art that I made. But it's just something I found while dicking around on ArtStation a while back from um, Gregory Fermanto, which okay. which um this this was a, it was a set of concept things that he did, just just messing around with doing car sketches. But mm -hmm. the idea that was presented within it was something I found fascinating. And I'm going to send you the link. Okay, cool. Yeah, I appreciate that. You know, presenting an idea of having a world where the cars are modern-ish, but the world isn't. Mm -hmm. And how you could, with that kind of concept, how you could feasibly do just about anything with it. Mm -hmm. oh, that's oh, yeah. what comes to mind when it comes to the whole multi-genre thing. And mm -hmm. when it comes to when it comes to have when it comes to having both high tech and ma and magic, is it a case is it a case like a lot of entries where they're diametrically opposed, or is it possible for someone to dip into both? So, on a world building kind of very thirty thousand feet in the air kind of view. Yeah, they look like they're diametrically opposed. However, even in character creation, a, a character can use skills and magical abilities, and there's nothing that stops them from that. And I, I think that's okay to me. And then magic, too, for me is... Oh, hey, Doc. Well, that's my daughter, sorry. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so it's not necessarily Vancean in the true sense. Like, there is a consequence for 
you know, throw out this really powerful spell, you know, and if you fuck it up, yeah, you're going to, you're going to, there's going to be some consequences to that. However, I wouldn't say it's rare in um, like the Vancian sense, in the sense that um, some societies in the multiverse are cool with magic and it's all over the place. In other places, they're like, mm, this is a little taboo. We don't like this. And they ban it or they snuff people out who use it. And so from a world building perspective, I try to encourage people to look at it beyond the, the simple us versus them, magic versus technology, and figure out where they want to play with that, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so like the core campaign that we're developing called a dark forest, that's, what's going to happen. It's the commonality versus the faceless. And then people kind of caught in between. And that gives a lot of, uh, it's kind of a lot of parallels between, you know, the, the West versus, you know, uh, various groups across the world during the war on terror. It was kind of a, kind of an exploration that the clash of cultures and ideas and ideologies and stuff. So, but yeah, I don't want character creation to be like well it's either this or this you can't do both why not do both and then you know that's going to complicate things for you mm-hmm. so um i remember um, there's one there's one line from the original thor movie that stuck with me when it comes to this whole balancing magic and tech in world building mm-hmm. um, where, thor, where thor says your ancestors called it magic you call it science I come from a world where they're one and the same. Mm. And I really like that I really like that line because it's it demonstrates a, a idea where the line between magic and tech is so is so blurry in some worlds that you can't tell them apart. Um, yeah. if I have to use a if I have to use a example in tabletop form that kind of flirts with this concept, it would be Numenera. Is oh it, yeah, yeah. Is Numenera a sci-fi setting? Yes. Is Numenera a fantasy setting? Yes. Is uh-huh. Num- <laughs> it, it the whole the whole idea <laughs> is taking Clark's third law, both both sides of Clark's third law to its logical extreme. Because yeah. every everybody only knows half of Clark's third law. Like a, a lot of people uh-huh. know the whole any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. But there's another half to that. Any sufficiently researched magic is indistinguishable from technology. Mm. But given that, in the full book, do you plan on putting in a, f- a few charts to kind of ra- to kind of randomly generate worlds that somebody might go into through these shimmers? Yeah, yeah. So we're gonna have uh, two options. So one option is is you know the the traditional RPG tables where you roll some di- six-sided dice and, and, and use a standard playing deck, or a little bit more freeform. I don't know if you've looked at the game, but uh, um, the guy who did Breathless also did a game called, uh, I believe it's called Stoneburger, and he randomly generates maps by putting something on the table and you roll the dice and you kind of figure out how to generate this map by rolling dice, and it's kind of a neat concept and I want to try and develop something similar for Wander so that way if you're tired of the old tables and you want to have something a little bit more lively on the table you can as well. Yeah, but I've yeah, seen, I want it. I've seen yeah, that kind ahead. of thing. I've oh, I've also seen the I've also seen the concept of um li- literally rolling dice on the, on a big sheet of paper and then drawing co- continents and the like around the dice that Around the dice locations, um, yeah. and the the um, card based world building that I saw in Mystic Empyrean is mm-hmm. an, is another instance. Um, now, when it comes to now, given that given that, and given the kind of the kind of freeform affair that that ends up happening with the with um f- with fudge and the like are i know you is it is it a case where magic would just be an, would just be an, would just be another form of for lack of a better term skill mm, i would say in part it's a skill but it's also i don't want to say it i think of magic as a 
in a number of layers, right? So it could be kind of like that skill. It could also be something that's uh, consumed and modifies your being or something that can be attached to something that's more like an artifact. Um, so yeah, so magic to me is a little bit more fluid. Uh, but yeah, the casting of actual magic, I don't know if I'd call it a true skill. Like, you know, you think of skills, you think of like almost this apprenticeship that goes on. It's very uh, I most, clear I mostly, cut. For what know. it's worth, I mostly meant skill in terms of a game, in terms of the game design and uh, uh, okay. not the, not the literal yeah. sense. Though yeah, that so, could be a route that could be taken. Yeah. Um, in this case, you do get uh, modifiers to your roles. Um, so as it currently sits, when you first purchase a, a magical ability, it's got a little bit more oomph to it than, say, a, a first-level skill, right? So um, when you do when you buy your ranks in skill in excuse me in magic, you get three dice added to your pool. Um, Probably with the core set, we're going to probably push that more to a more solid modifier. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you go to the next one, which is a, a plus five, and then a plus eight, which is like the uber magic user. So um, magic is a, a pretty cool way of, you know, leveling the playing field. Um, but it's also dangerous. You know, if you mess up, you know, you're going to take some stress hits. Um, and... You also, to use it, you have to spend something to be able to use it. So in, um, when it comes to skills, you basically add your stuff in, roll, how many successes you get versus the challenge, and you're done. Whereas magic, you know, you are putting all the stuff together, you roll, but uh, your character takes a hit in stress to use magic. And to me, that makes it a little bit more strategic as a, uh, as a game element, right? And so what I mean by that is, is that you as a player have to decide, all right, what kind of hit am I going to take to use this magical ability? And not only that, but like, what are going to be those consequences long term? Like if I take a big enough hit and I don't have anybody nearby, does that mean I'm dying now after using this particular spell? Which I think is kind of interesting in itself. You know, um, if you're using a more low level spell, it's, it's probably going to be... Um, uh, less of less of a dire consequence, but if it's a much heavier, you know, high level spell, yeah, it, it's going to cost you something. And if you mess up, it's going to cost you even more. And so I think that moves away from was it like D and D fifth edition where the spellcaster becomes what like the 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 quarterback everyone goes behind for protection and whatnot. And so um, I'd say know, it kills this, it kills off the mage as the system mastery um yeah. archetype, which is yeah. a lot of people have this idea that that's a pro that that's a problem that's somehow unique to like fifth edition no this has been a problem that's oh, going no. back since day one yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, well and, and i just use fifth edition as an as a an illustrative example because most people i talk with they their familiarity is fifth edition and i'm like okay we're going to use that as a, a baseline, but it's not the only one that has this problem. I think magic, you know, even when we were doing Dragon Town, um, magic, for a lot of folks, they want something that works perfectly, that has no consequences really. If you mess up, you know, it's very clean cut, you know, shoot and done. Fire and but forget. I, I want it to be messy. Yeah, go ahead. And because of the because of the fact that you're not doing fire and forget, you're kind of disqualified from any comparison between between the Vancian model and what you're doing. Since yeah, there's three there's three factors that I always ha I always um make note of when it comes to whether or not it counts as Vancian. Um, mm -hmm. preparation, fire and forget, mm -hmm. and long rests. Mm -hmm. Um. Preparations can also be memorization, but you need those three factors in order for it to count. Um, yeah. And f fire and forget is basically the spell is going to do that thing and always that thing. Like a fireball is yeah. going to, no matter how many different times or how good you roll when casting a fireball, it's going to have the same results. All roads lead to Rome. You can't reduce a fireball so that you could light somebody's cigarette, for instance. Yeah. Um, well, I, th I think it's kind of crazy, too. It's like, what if... And, and the thing is, is shit always happens, right? So, 
Well, you know, if you go to cast fireball and you you self emulate, you know, why not have that? I mean, that makes you really question. All right, did I prepare to cast this sucker out in the world, ho hoping for the best, and you know, knowing that most likely the worst is going to happen? And that's that's kind of how I approach magic. Is it's it's like that flamethrower. It's really cool when it works until you know something bad happens right and then you become barbecue yourself so. yeah obviously one of the bit one of the big cases of that, of that has been the magic system in um warhammer Fa in warhammer fantasy and the psychic setup in for in 40k but there's a, there's other approaches um for me for me the the bigger issue is, has always been the idea of magic as the as this system mastery kind of archetype um mm -hmm. which ends up leading to people assuming that say a mar that say a martial character is meant to be babby's first um character mm -hmm. and given the fantasy of uh that some people come into role playing games with um that can create a discrepancy i mm -hmm. talked about this on a on a stream not too long ago but i'm Imagine somebody is a big fan of these of some of the fight scenes, and let's go with Pirates of the Caribbean for this. You know, all mm -hmm. all of the parries, all the repasts, all the footwork. Then they get they want to do something like that with their D and D character, and mm -hmm. it amounts to just basic attack, or basic yeah. attack with some, but with some modifiers. They're not going to get that same feel. Yeah. Oh. Um, now. Within character creation for the, for this, you mm -hmm. have you have the whole thing with with um backgrounds, which are in <laughs> three which are in three de, three categories: minor, significant, and foundational. Yeah. What I'd like to ask on that is what you consider the dividing line between the between those three, because I think that's important to avoid the problem that aspects have in say fate, where there's not a whole lot yeah. of guidance. Yeah, so when I think of it, the first thing, and it's an idea that I developed originally in Rapture, um, and I shamelessly stole for this game as well, is that um, you start with a character concept and name, and then after that you do a little description, 50 words, not like 500 pages, and then what you do is you parse out you know, these elements. And so I think in the, in the example I give is Dr. Renix, I believe, and then, you know, so minor, I think of is, you know, yeah, it plays a role in your life, but it's not something that has completely changed the direction of who you are, but it's, it's kind of the, the baggage you carry. Significant is it's, it's change, you know, you get to a fork in the road and it's, it's definitely given you kind of a direction where to go. Foundational is without this. You would not your character as it as they currently exist would not exist, right? So, for example, uh, uh, Krennix is a idealist, right, and believes in the the progress of technology, and as such, that's pretty foundational belief, right? And without it, you, you can't really have her her essence that you're trying to create, and that's how I I see these essentially aspects. That's what they essentially are. Um, that are applied to the character. And then, of course, to use these backgrounds, you have to invoke luck, which is always a double-edged sword, right? So um, I always joked when I when I first started designing games with uh, a luck aspect is, is that, yeah, it can give you a bonus, but as the referee, I want something in return, right? It's like the monkey's paw, right? Be careful what you wish for or what you use in terms of luck because... That could be used down the line to not necessarily malign you, but to to throw a real serious challenge your way. And so backgrounds are a way to get an advantage, right? So a minor background is going to be a very small advantage. Significant, a little bit bigger. Foundational, significant, a very um, heavy hitting advantage. But uh, the other thing I liked about it too is is that in if you look at aspects in fate. I feel like they're very detached mechanically, if that makes sense. That 
they don't feel as heavy hitting as they should if that does that make sense you know where yeah. they they don't have that foundational nature that they're supposed to have that they talk them up really good but if you actually play the game you're kind of like sometimes it's hard to fit them in like how the hell do i use this thing right and of course that after a while when you get used to the system it, it becomes a little different but i wanted to make this as as intuitive as i could um I don't know if I succeeded, but it is something I do like that this idea that mechanically backgrounds have something you can quantify. And while that's kind of a fuzzy logic that I'm using there, I think it I think it works. So what's funny about that is um when I when I've covered fate game I've covered um and discussed fate games in the past, and one of the things I had said that was my big problem with the aspect system was a lack of guidance. You'll mm -hmm. no, you'll notice a bit of a pattern that got that proper guidance is a big de is a big deal. Um, oh yeah, because it, it talks some, whether it be Fate Core or or some of the worlds of adventure, they talk about a high concept aspect, a trouble aspect, and then three freebies. But in mm -hmm. terms of giving examples or giving or or demonstrating where the line is. There's mm -hmm. nothing on that. And yeah, with experience, you'll eventually figure it out to an extent. Yep. But I'm of the belief that no game should be should rely on veterancy to cover up its holes. Um, no. Especially no, since and that's... every game is someone's first. Yeah. And I and I think that's a that's a good point. I mean, um a lot of uh TTRPG YouTubers make this point as well when they're trying to introduce games to new players, is that we have to assume that those who are playing our game, one, don't know our game very well, and two, maybe don't know role-playing games that well. They could be noobs, right? Or maybe they never played this kind of system before. And so, yeah, I'm really big on giving guidance because, you know, I don't have time to figure it out sometimes. Sometimes I just want a little bit of guidance just to get me started and then maybe something I can go back to. And so I always try to add those references in, in a lot of my um, larger rule sets. The smaller rule sets, I, I kind of let have a little fiat with that. But yeah, no, guidance is a big one because that's what helps the hobby sustain itself. That's how we get new blood. That's how we get new players who come and play at our tables, right? That... And that's how we also keep GMs and DMs and referees from burning out, right? That's also that's also how we keep how we. The last, the last thing that the hobby needs is an ivory tower. Um, exactly. Or if you, if you want an example, if you want an example of where, the, of where the, that ivory tower thinking can lead, look at the boys club problem that a lot of professional hockey teams have, where they keep hiring uh -huh. people who are, keep hiring or bringing people in who are old faces of the same organization or another organization within the within the league or our, for, or our former players and and the like um, you end it ends up with the same mindset getting cycled um, mm -hmm. in, even w even when things around them start to start to shift but an example that I've used when it comes to the whole as a counter when it comes to the whole guidance thing is the one unique thing in 13th age now the one unique thing can be is meant to be one unique thing about your character. It's right there on the tin. But within yeah. the core book, there's a two-page spread that goes into good examples and why, questionable mm -hmm. examples, i.e., talk it out with your GM and why, and absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> and e each of them gets a paragraph or two. There's a, there's a few examples, and each one gets a paragraph or two. Explaining what, explaining why this is a good or questionable example, or why um, this is a absolutely not, um, and it, and it is built around a theme of the fact that it's meant to be more of a narrative thing, that and only situationally, mechanically relevant. Uh -huh. That's how that yeah. one unique thing is meant to be built to separate it from all the other mechanically relevant stuff that you're gonna get. So. With when it comes to backgrounds in the full book, do you plan on putting in ex examples to kind of give that guidance? Oh yeah, yeah. One of the things I want to do is is a I want to for the core book. Um, 
with character creation, I, I really thought about it and I'm trying to ha- do it figured out logistically. I want to have three to four pre-made characters and go through the process and then have that guidance like, hey, why is this a solid, minor, significant, or foundational background? Um, what does this do? And how does this impact maybe say long-term, short-term gameplay and so on? Um, because I think, like you said, one of my biggest problems with I guess maybe it's OSR or you know, maybe some the the FKR and a few others. And for those who don't know that, the old school Renaissance and then the was a free Kriegspiel revolution, which is it doesn't even roll off the tongue. Anyways, they they really make these really light rule sets and don't offer much in terms of how does this system work? How do you know it's working? And more importantly, if you're new to this, how do you know you're going in the right direction? Um, Because I'm going to say it, you know, when I first started GMing, DMing, refereeing, whatever you want to call it, um, we didn't didn't have the cool YouTube guidance today or the uh, people on Reddit who are constantly going on about how to run the game and what things to be aware of. And so... uh, I always felt lost and in some ways that kind of pushed me away from the hobby for a little bit. And then I came back and I want to make it to where the core rule set is only to beginners as it is veterans. Right. And so what I mean by that is, is that it's not condescending where you get that, what are role playing games and all this stuff. And you have to read through this, but giving little side notes, telling veterans like, Hey, you can skip this chapter. You probably know about this. If you're new to the game, go ahead and read this. This is some guidance for you. And then for veterans, how do you keep from burning out? You know, you know, styles of uh, refereeing, because I use the word referee in my games. Um, how do you referee a, a game without burning out? How do you do these campaigns? How do you lift the burden from the referee and spread it out across the, the group? So, yeah, I really want the, the rule book to be a resource more than just, oh, here are the rules, right? Um, and that's coming from some influence from the, the the FKR movement where they say, you know, uh, what we give players should be a resource more so than just a rule book, right? What the fuck does that mean? <laughs> yeah, so a source book, right? So it's interesting. So, you know, if you look at D&D, and I'll use it because it's a very popular example, even though I, I, shoot, I don't think I've played 5th since it came out. It's been a bit. Anyways, so... I've noticed that their guidance to players is scattered about. It's it, it. I feel like it's really inconsistent, right? And it feels like a rule book. It's very solid. You got the rules, and you don't really have kind of that fourth wall being broken by the writer saying, "Hey, this is how you handle these rules. This is what you need to look out for." So, although I hate the game sometimes, um, was it Burning Wheel has those little commentary boxes by the author. Have you, have you seen the rulebook recently from Burning Wheel? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I kind of like that style where you have like this intrusion, right? Um, even uh, Apocalypse World kind of had it. Um, Dogs in the Vineyard had it. Or, uh, yeah, Dogs in the Vineyard. God, that's a that's an old game that I wish would come back to. Um, where you had player, player-centered advice, right? It wasn't just for the referee, but it was for everybody playing. And I really like that, and I want to incorporate that in the rule set. Um, I did that with Rapture a lot. Um, I got a lot of shit for, you know, it being a larger rule book than it was supposed to be. And a lot of that is because I put in a lot of advice, a lot of guidance to players because I wanted them to feel comfortable in this system so they could play it, right? That's that's what pays me in the end of the day is when a player not only picks up the book and buys it, but also plays it and continues to play it and maybe shares it with others and then they buy it or they adopt it as a system that's really cool so mm-hmm. so with that with that set with that said um, mm-hmm. given given the given the wide breadth of po- of possibilities since this is a free a free form setup um mm-hmm. When it comes to those pregens that you're putting in, do you plan on putting in guidance to make sh- to minimize the risk of um, 
analysis paralysis, since that can be a thing when it comes to more freeform games. Yeah, so um, one of the things I've noticed about freeform games, too, is that uh, when you have people come from that game or games similar to it, uh, they have trouble with being told, hey, you have responsibility in making this game and um, building this character, becoming this persona, and so on. Um, it's it's a class. It's technically a classless system, even though we're we're looking about maybe developing kind of what we call an archetype. I would actually recommend model. that. Yeah, I like archetypes, um, and I've been reading a lot of ap ap uh, apocalypse, powered by the apocalypse games, and I like the idea of a a very friendly, like, hey, this is how you can plot your character. Here's your options, right? And then I think also giving players the license to make it their game, right? Um, sometimes I feel like um, pre-mades, I usually try to put them at the end of the book, so that way they're there, yes, but they're kind of out of sight, out of mind. There's a reference to them, they can go to them, and hopefully they're not spending too much time on them. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm trying to figure that out myself because I have that problem as a player. Sometimes I, I get that analysis paralysis mm -hmm. where I get fixated on a pre-made or or a particular approach that's lined out, and I forget. Hey, this is my game, right? I don't have to exactly follow this pathway or or create this specific character or any number of things, right? That come up with that. And um, I think that's something that the hobby is starting to really get better about, I would say, is that a lot of games are are encouraging players actively in their little intrusive commentary boxes or whatever to remember, like, at the end of the day, this is your game. And that's what I, I'm really trying to build into the core set that I'm building right now, is that this is your game one, two. Don't get fixated on the pre-mades. Don't get fixated on this particular approach. If something doesn't work and you think you could tweak it, do so. I don't care, right? Because um, at that point, I, I think, what was his name? There's this famous game designer who used to say, well, you know, it was my game at one point. Then I sent it off to the printer. The printer printed it. It's now on Amazon. You bought it. Now it's yours. And that's kind of the mentality I'm trying to approach with it. And I also, when I do my little videos to show people how to play and stuff, one of the things I always try to put out there is, is like, hey, while this is how we did it in this video, you can change this. You can modify this. You can make this a little bit more your own or make it a little bit less burdensome if you think it's more, if it's too burdensome for you and your players. And so, yeah, um, that's that's kind of how I'm, I'm approaching it is, uh, yes, it's free form. Yes, they're great examples. However, if you need to add something to it or take away, do so as a player. That's your that's your duty now that it's your game. Mm -hmm. So with that said, I, um, what are you shooting for as far as a page count? Do you think this is going to be as light as what you had with Rapture, or do you think it's going to be a bit beefier? Um. So this is this is what we're we're thinking. So for the first year, we're going to go with a living rule set. So we have the ultralight out there just to kind of whet everyone's appetite. And then here in about a month or two, we're going to release the beginnings of what we call a living rule set. This is kind of like a, a a living alpha that'll later become a beta, and then a more you know solidified document that we're going to share out with the um, with our our fans and, and those who are interested. And so as far as count-wise, I want to keep it under 300 pages. Um, I think that's pretty light for, for some books out there. I mean, I have a Pathfinder 2nd Edition here. I think it's like eight, almost 800 pages, I think. I don't know. It's a, mo it's a monster. It's a beautiful book. But I want to try to keep it lightweight so that way it's, again, beginner-friendly, but also veteran-friendly. Like, they don't have to flip through hundreds of pages to find what they're looking for. Um, once we get it kind of nailed down through the living core set, we're going to start solidifying it in a, in a PDF and print version. And uh, one thing that's included with 
the core set that is going to be coming out here soon is a living campaign. All right, and I'm going to have to put an asterisk next to that because it's not the traditional living campaign that you're familiar with from D&D and various others. Um, it is not a con-centric game. It's very much a game where we're going to build a a resource, an electronic resource, in which players who are who have adopted this game can come and take content from it. And it's you know there's new events, new encounters. Um, the the campaign's called a dark force, so it brings out our bad guys that are that are talked about in the intro in w- one of those pictures I gave you, and um, really sets up this to be something that's easy to adopt, has tons of content, and hopefully one day is going to be solidified in a nice PDF and of course a print document, um, a book. I'm hoping uh, full color. Uh, hardback is what we're looking at right now Hmm. so so yeah that's that's kind of the end goal is to take this ultralight set flesh it out um get some feedback flesh it out revise it edit it do all that sorts of sort of stuff take really a year to try and go through that and get some real deep feedback and then start building the finalized products and then of course um, one of those being this kind of living campaign setting where new stuff is coming out. And it'll probably be, to be honest, you know, when it, when I make games, I try to make them as affordable as possible because I know, you know, we're all pinched for money these days. And so really what when the, the, the finalized rule set comes out, it'll probably be about the same model as Rapture, 5 to $10. And then any additional stuff will come uh, free. So basically, I'm trying to set it up to where, you know, there's there's a very low barrier to entry. Um, the ultralight will always be free, but like, you know, the core and stuff like that, very cheap, very uh, easy to access. So that way people can play. That's that's really what I want people to do with this, is to play the game, play in this multiverse, have a good time, and maybe meet the man in teal, in the teal suit, you know. Mm-hmm. I, I, can, I can certainly get behind that. Yeah. Now, as as I rec- as I recall, the launch date for the crowdfund is going to be in about thirty two days at the, at the time of this recording. Yeah, so we're looking at that. We're trying to see if if we want to go forward with it right now. We we really want to, but if it's something that you know doesn't have the demand, because I know we have, we're just coming out of was it uh, uh, the Zine Quest mm-hmm. uh, and then and various other large scale. Um, game crowdfunding. So if it doesn't really launch, we're still going to develop this thing. Again, anybody who wants to play it, you can download it on itch. I bl- it's also on Drive Through RPG for pay what you want. Um, and so we're really just trying to get people's interest, uh, get them interested in this little multiverse that we've created, and hopefully expand it. And really, one of the ideas is is to make it a collaborative effort building this. Um, this multiverse. Mm-hmm. I can I can certainly get that, and I look forward to seeing how it develops. But with that yeah. said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. Well, I appreciate it. It's been awesome. It's always fun coming and talking to you. So, and anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. (laughs) I appreciate that. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.